systems um, maintenance and operations and you know whole purpose is to really inspire water stewardship and really taking care of both the quantity and quality of our water and uh, you know years ago uh, um, this a wise man told me he said you know there's three really important things in life and the most important thing is love and the second most important thing is connection and you know, that's, that's pretty profound. The third most important thing is making sure you have a functioning septic system. <laughs> so, you know, glad we're here today. We're going to feel the love from, from these great presenters. I really appreciate Meadow Center, uh, Jenna, and, and uh, Desiree. Uh, you know, we've worked for over a decade with Meadows on the Cypress Creek Watershed Protection Plan. So, this is the it's an EPA approved plan. It's the first. Um, plan in Texas that actually has a groundwater protection component in it. The whole purpose of it is to protect the water quality in Cypress Creek. And we made the argument of, hey, if we don't protect groundwater, there is no water in Cypress Creek. And we kind of saw that this last year, and we're even still really struggling um, with the flow there at Jacobs Well. And so, um, but today we're really going to talk about, we're going to learn um, um, from AgriLife and Robin and Jenna and uh, about septic systems, how to maintain them, and uh, how many how many folks, I mean, I'm assuming everybody here has, how many folks have septic systems? Almost, yeah, okay, look well, good, that's 100%. <laughs> um, and how many people have groundwater wells? All right, does anybody have a rainwater harvesting system? Okay, so well, there you go, about half, about half of the folks got money, so, so, um, we got the supply side. We're going to talk about the treatment side. And so my first, first, I've got five T-shirts I'm going to give out here. Jacob's Well and one Barton Springs T-shirt. Does anybody know what the what what is the thing in our hill country streams a nutrient that really we can't really take in the streams very much of it? Is, is there there's a nutrient that that wastewater has in it? If it gets in our streams, it creates algae. Does anybody know what that, that nutrient is? Phosphorus. Boom! Who said it back there? Okay. Well, here's some. Yeah, you can go ahead and take those. And, and, uh, I'll strike a match. <laughs> yeah, okay. So, so uh, and, and, and I've got some stickers back there, some Jacob's Well stickers. The last thing I'll say, and then turn it over to Robin, uh, this Friday night, at the San Marcos Library, we're having an opening. We started this program called Art for Water. So we're working with artists to tell stories about water and springs. This is the Sacred Springs uh, uh, Kite Collection. So it's over 65 of these beautiful big art kites that are hung in the library, in the activity center, and over at Meadow Center. The Friday night, uh, starting at 5 p.m., we're gonna have a reception five to nine there at the San Marcos Library. You're all invited uh, food and um, some in the library making mocktails for us. So uh, that, that'll be really fun and some beautiful art. And um, it, it's hung all throughout the library there. It'll be up through, this, through to September. And then Robin put together some amazing posters that sort of tell the story of the eight great springs that are featured in the collection. So yeah, because it will be there, you know, you can't make it Friday, it'll be there all summer, but there's some flyers there in the back. And uh, thank you all for being at, coming out and um, focusing on the stewardship of our water. And uh, I'll turn it over to Robin. Thank you all for being here. Thank you very much, David. Great intro. Um, we are gonna talk about septic systems. And the reason for, for this discussion is because it could potentially impact your well, or um, it could potentially impact surface water. Um, the best way to protect all of us and our water supplies is to maintain um, fully functioning uh, septic systems. And the best way to do that is to learn more about them. Um, the US EPA says that uh, failing septic systems are a major source of contamination in karst areas. And uh, here in, in Wimberley, in Western Hayes County, 
we absolutely do have karst here. There's a picture of Wimberley Bat Cave and the holy rocks that we see on the surface everywhere. And those are very poor filters. And so whatever goes in through those rocks can reach our groundwater and our springs. So while we're living on karst, one of the best things we can do is understand those septic systems and, um, and take good care of them. If you don't understand it, you don't know how to care and feed for it either. And I'd like to introduce um, Ryan Gerlich with AgriLife Extension. He is a guru on septic systems, and he's going to talk more about uh, the care and feeding of, of different systems. I'll give you this, and then we can switch to this presentation. Thank you. Welcome. Little disclaimer: the allergies are brutal. In conversation with allergens, I should say, so my voice is a little. You got a cough drop in to help me survive, so I apologize if my voice is going in and out. Uh, but what I'm going to talk about is basically what is on site wastewater treatment or what are on site sewage facilities, why we're concerned about wastewater, which is already kind of mentioned um, a few minutes ago. And then I'll talk about the evolution of wastewater treatment. So by that, I mean really how our technologies have changed, um, how our, our systems have changed. And then uh, I'll go over how these systems operate. And then a couple of the big things is when you pump out a septic tank and then how to live with the system. So by that, I mean kind of what should or shouldn't go down the drain. Let me move this thing. <clears throat> so what is, an on-site wastewater treatment system or what is a septic system, most people want to ask if they point at the green spot in the yard. So this photo here, you can see the green stripes over the drain field. And so this is a functioning system. That grass is usually a little bit greener over the drain field because that's where the moisture is and that's where the, the nutrients are. This is a functioning system. Uh, that grass is there and utilizing those nutrients, pulling up that moisture. And so it's playing a vital role in that, that treatment process. Again, this is functioning. Uh, it might be a shade or two greener over the drain field area. If we looked out here and we saw cattails or some type of water loving vegetation, then that would be a, a different story. And that would lead me to believe that that system is either overloaded or it's, it's failing. And so again, you may or may not see the greener area over your drain field or around your spray heads. It also has to do with how much water you use on a regular basis. So who sets the rules or the standards for these systems? Uh, it's the Texas Commission on Environmental Quality. Uh, it's the chapter 285 rules. I've got a copy up here in case anybody hits me with any really hard questions that we got to look back through. Uh, but this is the, the minimum standards for these systems in Texas. And then uh, usually around the state, there's 254 counties. So every county is a little bit different. But the majority of the counties have adopted more stringent standards. And so they have a local authorized agent. So that's the office that you would go to uh, to request a, a permit or to apply uh, for a permit to install a system. Or if you wanted to file a complaint against a neighboring property or system. And so we've got, is it Victoria? What is the, the name of your office officially? Oh, it's a development services. Development services mm -hmm. for, for Hayes County. So she's the one you go to for. Um, you know, copy of your permit or to uh, possibly file a complaint against a failing system or something like that. So they're the local authorized agent. And so they can take the state standards and apply more stringent standards. They can't really be lenient on those state standards, but they do have the ability to apply more stringent standards. And so what is a malfunctioning system? You got a pretty good example of one here. So the green thing that you see in the middle uh, that's the lid that we have on the access riser. So nowadays when we install systems, um, even though the tanks are buried, we want to be able to um, have an access point for doing the maintenance, the pumping, inspections, and so on. And so we'll add access risers. There's several different brands, different materials, uh, but the majority of them are plastic material. And so what it does is it brings a secure lid up to the surface to make it easier to Again, to pump out and inspect the system. You no longer have to dig. You can just unscrew that lid and pump it out. But if you look around that lid, you see all the standing water there. So this is a malfunctioning system. 
there's surfacing, you know, there's wastewater on top of the ground. And uh, you can see it, all the standing mud and water. And then anybody that's in that area, if they walk through that, there's a potential to come into contact with pathogens, which are disease causing microorganisms. And then also, so the, these systems are labeled as on site sewage facilities. That key word is on site. So it means that water is, is treated on the property that it's generated. And so the water can really only leave your property through a couple of ways, either going up or down. So the water can evaporate or be transpired through the plants and so it returns to the atmosphere or it's treated in the soil and returns down to our, our water table. So really the water can just leave the property again by going up or down. When I did this inspection here, I noticed the homeowner dug a trench, it connected to the ditch. And at that time I had cut the photo down to hide the name on the mailbox and the car. But the little sliver of blue right here is Galveston Bay. So this is no longer an on-site system because that wastewater is running off the property and pretty much right into the bay. And I ran across many uh, clever means of people doing this. They hide pumps in random places and stuff like that and discharge the water onto the neighboring, neighboring property. So that's a, a malfunctioning system. Would it smell like food? Yeah, well, this is on the coast so there's always a wind, so it wasn't as bad, but, but yeah, there would definitely be a, a hydrogen sulfide or rotten egg kind of odor around you. And then also, it is possible for this stuff to make its way back into the home. When I did this inspection, I rang the doorbell. The dogs went crazy. When the homeowner opened the door, the dogs ran out. They followed me around when I was doing the inspection. So the homeowner realized they were being a nuisance. So they called the dogs back in when they watched me the rest of the day from the couch with that stuff on their paws. So <laughs> it is possible for it to make its way back into the home. So just a quick history of these systems. Um, and so the early definition of a working system was, yeah, my toilet flushes. And so that was really all that we cared about. It wasn't until 1989 that we uh, that there was a statewide guidance for installing these systems in Texas. And probably our biggest rule change occurred in, in 1997. And so that's when we had changed our approach to evaluating the soils before we install the system. So if you're gonna install a system on your property, uh, one of the first things that'll happen is a, a licensed site evaluator would come out there and they would dig at least two holes around that proposed drain field area. And what they're looking at is that soil's ability to accept and treat that wastewater. And so if you can dig, and so this is really what determines what type of system you have. If you can dig a post hole on your property, say three to four foot deep, uh, without hitting any clay or a rock or saturated soils, then chances are you can still put in a regular septic tank in rain field. Uh, and the areas where we have a lot of rock or clay, or especially along the coast, we have a high water table, uh, then we, we have to look at an alternative type system. And so the readily available technology for on, or alternative systems is the aerobic treatment unit. So that might give you a, a better understanding of why you may have a, a particular system that you have. And this drawing here just shows this is the house or this would represent the septic tank. This is our drain field. And so for a drain field to function properly, what we want is two foot of good aerobic soil below that, that drain field. So by aerobic soil, I mean a well-drained, uh, coarser textured soil so that oxygen can actually get down here and treat that wastewater. So with a regular septic tank and drain field, a lot of our treatment is actually occurring in that one to two foot of soil around those, those trenches. I have a question. Yes. In our area, we're typically, um, you know, just limestone, just pollution. Right. Um, is that a little bit or not? Most likely, I would I would think so. Um, probably with, usually they'll bring in some type of field where at least we can support some kind of vegetation on over the top. top. On top right. of the pollution. Right. So with pollution, I mean, it's generally... There's not a formal definition for that word of in all my slowest classes, but it, usually we assume it's something with a higher clay content. Is that, is that what you mean? Or um, and so usually in that situation, that's where we have the aerobic systems. I've seen both systems in basically the same 
story. Okay. And I'm not sure how they decided which one is and which one isn't. So a gravity fed grain field, we can only put in kind of consider like a sandier soil or a loamy soil or possibly a sandy clay soil. Um, and then if it's a, a heavy clay soil, we can pressurize the grain field and install something known as low pressure distribution or low pressure dosing. And so that's one of the few systems that still uses a septic tank for the pretreatment and then uses a, a grain field type system. But with that, we're actually pressurizing that wastewater and sending it out to that grain field. So it's not sitting there over the saturated building. Would that also be um, driven by the, the year that the house was built? Because I don't think aerobic systems were as popular back then. Right. Yeah, these exactly. So, um, 1997 is when a lot of the aerobic systems really started to show up in Texas. With the exception of the Beaumont, Southeast Texas area, um, a lot of the aerobic manufacturers were out of the Louisiana originally, just with the clay soils and the high water tables and saturated environment there. And so, with the exception of that area, the rest of the state, of pretty much the aerobic systems didn't really show up until until 1997. So if it was put in before that, it may be a regular. And the coverage of that is anaerobic? Right. So, well, anaerobic is a septic tank, which I'll get to. <laughs> and so the reason for the changes with the soils, uh, evaluating the soils before we put in the system is so we can put something that's going to work on that property to protect both public and environmental health. So these are kind of the steps that we go through when we're installing a system or the kind of the pre, um, the early steps, if you will, all the way through. So the first thing we do is we evaluate the source. And so the source is whoever's generating that wastewater. So is it a restaurant, you know, out in the country or is it a, a home? And so we want to have a good understanding of the source because it helps us estimate the hydraulic load. So how much water and then the organic load. So what's in that wastewater? So if it's a restaurant or something like that, there's going to be a lot more organic material, a lot more fat soils and grease versus if it's a, you know, a typical household. And then we evaluate the sites. So we're looking at the soils, the characteristics of the property to determine that site's ability to accept and treat that wastewater. And then with that information, uh, we can you know, design the system, select the appropriate components. And then operation and maintenance is important to ensure that they continue to operate as the one. And so what is a, excuse me, a septic tank? Uh, it's a watertight container. Uh, they're typically made out of concrete, plastic, or fiberglass. Uh, they're not made out of metal or wood or anything like that that's going to degrade in this environment. And so the way that these tanks operate is based off of a long detention time or a slow movement of water through the system. So if you're in the house and you flush the toilet, that water enters here on the inlet tee, comes into the tank. Ideally, it would take it two to three days to travel across the tank and go out to the, to the drain field. And so what this does is it allows our solids to settle out. So our fats and our greases float up to the top and form a scum layer on the top. Our sludge layer settles out to the bottom and forms a sludge layer along the bottom of the tank. And what we're left with is a clear layer in the middle. And so on the outlet side, we'll have a baffle or a T situated roughly halfway down into that tank. So, so we're just sending that clear liquid out to our drain field. We want to retain as many solids as possible in that septic tank. Now, we do not want the solids going out to the drain field. And then within the septic tank, <laughs> We do have anaerobic conditions. So they, these are microorganisms that live in the absence of free oxygen. The easiest way to tell that it's anaerobic is it's it stinks. So if someone were to, if you're having the tank pumped out, someone opens it up, it's not a pleasant odor coming off the neck. And so those anaerobic microorganisms, they'll break down the sludge layer by about 50% or so, but eventually it accumulates to the point to where uh, it would need to be pumped out. So the solids don't magically disappear. They're reduced, but only to you know a certain extent. Uh, think about a fire in the fireplace, you know, if you or a fire pit. So if you stuff that fireplace full of logs before you go to bed, you know, what's the what are you going to do the next morning? You're going to shovel out the ashes. And so it's kind of the same thing here. Not everything breaks down 
And so some stuff is going to accumulate and it's going to be removed when you have that system comes out. And so um, keep in mind, if you take just one thing away from this, just keep in mind the calm conditions that we want through the tank. So the biggest violator that I, that I run across in the field is laundry day. So if you have one day of the week that you do your entire household worth of laundry, or you've got kids in college that show up with you know four trash bags worth of laundry, <laughs> and you do all that in a short period of time, you take the nice calm conditions that are in this tank and basically convert them over to white water rapids. And when that happens, we stir up the solids that are in the tank and we end up carrying those solids out to the, to the drain field. Once those solids go out to the drain field, uh, what happens is they can plug up the pore spaces in the soil. And then when that happens, that's when that water is forced to go up. So that's when it starts to, to surface into the yard. So this is just a little animation showing how water would move through the, the septic tank and then eventually out to the drain field. And so it's moving by gravity and again out to the drain field where we have a perforated pipe laid into a bed of gravel. This shows what happens if you don't pump a system out on a regular basis. Eventually, the solids accumulate to the point where they're close to that outlet T or sometimes even encasing it. So when that happens, uh, that's when we start to carry over solids into our drain field, which again shortens the life of that drain field. So if we plug up the four spaces of the soils in the drain field, it's pretty hard to recover from that point. You're looking at spending quite a bit of money to either put in a new drain field or probably your best option would be to take about a six month vac vacation to let that entire drain field dry out, let the solid break down and, and decompose. So in a little while, I'll talk about when to pump out a system. This is, keep this in mind, this is why it's important to pump them out on a regular basis so the solids don't accumulate to the point to where we're carrying them over out into the drain field. Uh, this is, again, just a cutaway, <laughs> excuse me of a septic tank and then the drain field and so the water moves by gravity out of the tank and then out to the drain field and so it can be laid into a bed of gravel like you see here before we cover that gravel up we put a layer of fabric down and it's known as geotextile fabric and so this is pretty similar to a weed barrier like you'd see in the landscaping department at a store and so what it does is it locks the the soil is from falling down and plugging up the pore spaces in the gravel. There's alternatives to that gravel filled trench. And so again, this is if you have the soils to support a septic tank and drain field. Um, and so it really depends on where you're located in the state as far as what type of you know, drain field material the installer would go with. It really has to do with the price of gravel in your particular area. So one option is, is gravel is pipe. We've got a little short section of one here, and so it's either an eight or 10 inch diameter pipe. And so the installer would excavate the trench, they lay this pipe in there. It has a little stripe on the top, so we know which way is up. And then it has holes in roughly the five o'clock and, and seven o'clock positions. And then it's wrapped in a geotextile fabric to keep the soils from coming in the holes and, and plugging up this pipe. So as the name implies, it's installed without any gravel. Uh, there's another system out there, another method that's pretty common. Uh, it's known as, as leaching chambers. And so again, this would be found behind a, a septic tank. I've got a little section of wood here that I cut off. Uh, but basically all this is is a, a plastic dome. And so the installer excavates the trench. We lay these chambers in there. And so it maintains that void space in here, this open space. And so the water on this particular one just enters through an end cap. And then after that, it drains down onto like a stepping stone or a splash plate. And then after that, it just moves along the bottom of the trench. And then the sidewalls are louvered. They're at an angle, so the water can also leach out through the sides. And so again, another method that's out there uh, with this. Um, again, it really depends on the price of gravel in your, your area. But the installer can usually bring it up to, to complete a job, enough leaching chambers in the back of a regular truck versus, you know, trucking in several loads of, of gravel. And then with all this stuff, usually the shallower, the better. And so we'll typically cover this with maybe eight inches to a foot of soil. We want it relatively shallow into the soil columns so that oxygen can get down there and treat that wastewater um, around this, this trench. 
So low pressure distribution. <laughs> I saw in the the questions that were submitted, there were quite a few people that had low pressure dosing systems or low pressure distribution. Uh, and so what this does is we have our septic tank. And so we have a standard septic tank. So the water coming in from the house goes through the septic tank, but instead of draining directly out to the drain field, we have another tank installed behind the septic tank that serves as a pump tank. And so within that pump tank, we have a low pressure pump and then we'll have, excuse me, we'll have some float switches in there. And so what these do is they signal to that pump that there's water in the tank. So the, the float switch will go up and then the pump will click on until this drops back down. And so the installer would set this, the tether link, link to kind of regulate how much water goes out uh, for each dose. And then we above that, we'll have a second float uh, that's an alarm. So in case that pump were to fail um, and the water would get really high in that tank, this one would go off and it would, you would hear the buzzing and you would see a red light go off. And so that's what usually what the top load is, is an alarm load. And so the advantage with low pressure distribution is <clears throat> we're adding this pump tank. So what it does is it collects and holds that water and then it sends a pressurized dose throughout the drain field. So it provides a uniform application throughout the entire drain field. And then the pump shuts off and the drain field gets eight to 12 hours or more to kind of rest and recover before the next dose. And so it can kind of help extend the life of your drain field because it's not a steady stream of water trickling out there, saturating the drain field. It just receives that dose. And then the pump shuts off and the drain field gets a chance to kind of again rest and recover. And then also, if you had changes in elevation that wouldn't facilitate gravity flow, say if the pipe, the plumbing came out of the house really deep, um, so by the time it got to the tank, it's already you know, well below grade, and so it might be too deep to install a, a drain field uh, with low pressure distribution would, could overcome it. Or if you had changes in elevation on your property that wouldn't facilitate gravity flow, you know, adding this pump would, would overcome it. So, um, a couple of advantages there, again, on that. It provides that uniform dose, and then the drain field gets to rest and recover, and also it's not impacted by changes in elevation on, on your property. With low pressure distribution, the pipes are smaller, so it's not a four inch drain pipe. It's usually maybe an inch and a half diameter pipe that's out in the drain field, and it has a small hole facing downward that's drilled every few feet. And so it's again just usually a, a smaller drain or, or possibly a narrower drain field. And then with low pressure distribution, because since there were so many people that mentioned they had it, um, these drain fields are maintenance items. And so usually at the very end of the drain field, we'll have an elbow coming up. And then usually it's buried, they're not always there. Uh, but we'll have little caps on the end. And so, you know, every few years you can actually or a maintenance provider could come out there, uh, remove these caps, and then operate that pump to flush these lines out. And uh, these lines have pretty small holes in them. Uh, they usually have an eighth inch diameter hole or something around that. So it can become plugged with solids over time. So it is something that is a maintenance item. And so we could actually unscrew these caps, operate the pump to flush the solids. Uh, in some situations, we might take a fish tape like an electrician would use and then put a bottle brush on there and run it up each of those lines to scrub the inside of that pipe and then, then flush it. So just, just something to keep in mind if you have a low pressure dosing system. Uh, there's other alternatives out there. Say if you didn't have that suitable soil for, for a regular septic tank and drain field, but for some reason you may be opposed to an aerobic type system, uh, you can bring in that good soil and mound it above the existing grade and then construct a pressurized drain field inside of that mill. So just another option that's out there. They're not overly common in Texas just due to the expense of bringing in the material and then you know trying to make it work work with your existing landscape. Yes, sir. The pump tank is the most generally have a mass layer pump and just a regular pump. Just uh, <laughs> just an effluent pump. So we, we don't want to send solids out to that because there's just an eighth inch hole. So it'll have 
it's usually it's an effluent pump. You know, it might be capable of handling. It'll say in the label the package that it's capable of handling up to two inch solids, but we don't want to send that out to the to the grain field. So the the idea is that the, the septic tank is doing its job of retaining the solids, and we're just sending clear liquid out to that pump. Too. This is it's kind of hard to make out. This is one that we installed in the Corpus Christi area. We had good sandy soil here, but if you dug a hole 18 inches down, you were seeing standing water. So there was a high water table. This homeowner did not want an aerobic type system. I forgot their reasoning why, but uh, we were able to, in that area, sand is pretty cheap along the coast. And so we constructed this mounted system. So I think it was 30 foot wide at the base and about 80 foot long. And so it's about two foot above the existing way. So just another, uh, option that's out there. So regardless of what you have, you want to protect that green field area. Uh, do what you can to really all we want is just grass over the green field. So try to avoid planting woody vegetation or anything like that around the green field. All that we really want is a grass cover. Again, that, that grass can help pull up the, the moisture and the nu nutrients. During the winter time, if your grass goes dormant, you can throw out a cool season grass um, seed to help establish vegetation during that period. Uh, but again, keep the keep the heavy equipment off of the, the drain field. Don't drive your vehicles across it. Uh, don't construct decks, driveways. I've seen tennis courts, basketball courts over the top of drain fields. Uh, none of that stuff is, you know, is ideal. On this system here, there's a little inspection port down here at the bottom where we're pumping out the system. When I opened that lid, there was water all the way to the top of that inspection port. So it was obvious that water was not draining out like it should. I looked around for the drain field. I couldn't find any signs of it. So finally, I asked the homeowner where it was located. It was right here underneath the sidewalk. And it went around the house underneath uh, another sidewalk. And I know these are stepping stones and you see the granite, but under, underneath all that was a heavy plastic weed barrier. So, there was no evaporation or transpiration occurring here. So he really kind of choked off the top of his, his brain here. So the other system that's extremely popular, probably at least 60% of the systems that go in, in in Texas every year are aerobic type systems. And so again, you'll find these where we have um, soils with a high clay content or a lot of rock or possibly you know, saturated soils or seasonal water table. And so if you have an aerobic system, congratulations, you own your own wastewater treatment plant. This is the same technology that the city wastewater treatment plant utilizes. It's just scaled down and installed in, in your yard. And so the way that these systems operate is, um, and I'll keep in mind there's 20 something different products approved for use in Texas. Their kind of layout and configuration might vary, or some of the components might vary, but this really, pretty much the operating principle is, is the same. So the first component that we'll go through is just a small septic tank, and we call it a trash tank. And so this is going to remove some of the non-degradable materials and stuff like that. Um, provide a little bit of settling, <laughs> try to remove some of the fats, and before we go into our aeration tank. And so with this tank, uh, in the trash tank, we have anaerobic conditions. So it's just a small septic tank. So the next component that we go to is our aerobic tank. So we're going to pump air into this tank. And so what that's going to do is it's going to create aerobic conditions. That means we're, we're pumping that air into that tank so the oxygen can transfer into that water, and that creates aerobic conditions. That means we have that dissolved oxygen present in that water. It's just like a fish aquarium. Uh, you see the little aerator blowing bubbles in a fish aquarium. You put the oxygen in there to keep the fish alive. It's pretty much the same thing here. We're blowing air into this aeration tank so that oxygen can transfer into that water to allow aerobic microorganisms to live and thrive. And so usually most manufacturers operate with some type of electrical uh, pump mounted on the surface. There's a few that have them uh, mounted internally that, where there's an aspirator that spins and rotates, uh, but probably 90 something percent of them will use something like this. And so this is a linear air compressor uh, that's pretty common on aerobic systems. So this thing runs 
24 seven pumping that air into that tank. And so again, the, the oxygen transfers into here creates aerobic conditions. And so those aerobic microorganisms provide a faster treatment um, and produce a higher quality wastewater coming out of here. And so a properly functioning aerobic system is capable of removing 85 to 98% of the bad stuff. And so with that, uh, we can add a disinfection component, and then we have more options when it comes to applying that water to our, our landscaping. So we can disinfect it, and we can actually send it out through spray heads or uh, through drip tubing. Um, so uh, again, we've got a couple different options because it provides a higher quality wastewater coming in. Um, one thing I'll point out, since there were so many people with aerobic systems on the on the email, these systems are maintenance items. Uh, and so generally, we'll usually have a contract with a maintenance provider that comes out there on a quarterly basis. And what they do is they measure for any solids that might accumulate in the pump tank. Uh, they check to make sure that there's chlorine residual in here, so we're getting this infection. And then they're going to check the air pump. The air pump has an air filter on there. And then it depends on the manufacturer, but down here where the bubbles are coming out, some manufacturers just have holes drilled in the pipe. Some of them have a diffuser like this screwed on there, just like you would see in a fish aquarium. And so your maintenance provider would usually check the air pressure to make sure that everything is, is flowing like it should, that we're getting, there's not too much back pressure on the air pump. This is an example of what could cause back pressure on the air pump. So this is a diffuser pulled out of a tank that had a lot of um, hard water. So you can see the calcium accumulating on here. And so this is blocking off the airflow. What it's gonna do is it's gonna create more back pressure for that air compressor and the air, air compressor is gonna get hot and eventually fail. So uh, just one of the, a couple of the, the maintenance things that we look at with the aerobic system. And a lot of the air pumps, the externally mounted air pumps, they can be rebuilt. So usually, uh, the one that I have here on the counter, this linear type air compressor, it has rubber diaphragms in there that can last usually two to four years, and then they can usually be rebuilt. So a little a rebuild kit for an aerator is usually around $100. It's, um, and so they're relatively easy to take apart, repair, and put back into to operation. This is a cutaway of showing them the aerobic tank. And so on this manufacturer here, that aerator, the air pump's actually hidden under this housing right here. And then it's connected to these air lines that are extending down to near the bottom of the tank. And then for the water to leave <laughs> the aeration portion of the tank, it uh, would exit up through this cone. So we have uh, in this area here, there's bubbling and mixing, you know, a lot of turbulence going on. But inside this cone, it's nice and calm. And so for the water to leave the aeration portion of the tank, it has to travel up this cone and then go out that way. And so the idea is the water travels up slow enough that any solids that are in the water uh, would settle out, they follow the contour of the cone, return back to the aeration portion for additional treatment. So with an aerobic system, just as I talked about a septic system, if you're using if you're doing several loads of laundry back to back to back with a septic tank, you risk stirring up solids in the septic tank. With an aerobic system, if there's a lot of water being used in a short period of time, uh, we can force solids to go through the clarifier and then they end up accumulating in the pump tank, which can shorten the life of that $300 pump that's, that's hanging in. This is taken with a video microscope. So this isn't anything you would see if you get all the pop open the lid or anything like that. Uh, but this is a rotifer uh, consuming that waste material. And so this is a sample that we pulled out of the aerobic system. And so these guys are in there, they're consuming that waste material. They reduce it down to less harmful materials. So they, they take the, the solids, they reduce them down to carbon dioxide and water, and then more cells they, they reproduce. And so I have this up here so you realize that it is a biologically driven process. Mm -hmm. And so, again, these guys uh, show up naturally in this environment. Uh, they didn't come from a box from a hardware store or anything like that. Um, they show up on their own. <laughs> and so keep in mind, just as if you wouldn't want to bathe in a bunch of acid or chemicals, well, neither do 
to these guys. And so um, a little bit later, I'll talk about what should or shouldn't go down the drain. We don't want to send any chemicals or anything like that down the drain. It's going to upset this biology and potentially kill these guys. And then this is also taken out of an aerobic system. And so this is a light. You can see it drawing in that material. It would consume that waste material and we can break it down to less harmful materials. We weren't able to provide lunch today, so Robin asked that I put in <laughs> slides to help curve that appetite. <laughs> so with, with the aerobic systems, if we apply that water to the surface, it has to have some type of disinfection. Uh, the most common method of disinfection in Texas is fluorine. And so we'll either have a tablet coordinator or a liquid coordinator. Uh, so with a tablet coordinator, you'll have uh, usually an access port that you can unscrew and then inside of there is a tube that has some slots cut in the bottom. And so what you would do is you access that tube and then you add a few tablets and then slide that tube back into there. And so this tube will hold probably 15 or 20 tablets, but we usually recommend just put it in a handful of tablets at a time. If you fill this tube all the way to the top, what can happen is the water will wick up and it can cause a tablet in the middle to swell and it would prevent the other ones from falling down there and providing that disinfection. So the way that this works is as the water flows through out of the clarifier into the pump tank, it passes through this little basin here and it erodes the tablets as it passes through and that's what's providing the disinfection. These are wastewater specific tablets. They are not swimming pool tablets. Uh, swimming pool tablets are an acid. Wastewater tablets are base. If you mix those two, it would melt this entire coordinator. And then also swimming pool tablets, uh, in this type of situation where the tablets are only wet and water is being used in the home, if you put a swimming pool tablet in that environment and it sees a constant wetting and drying, it can release an explosive gas, which could accumulate in the pump tank. And then if you have any shorts in the wiring here, you know, it could create a, a dangerous situation. So if you have a tablet coordinator, make sure that you're using the wastewater specific tablets. You can find them in the plumbing department of your hardware stores. Uh, they're far away from the, the swimming pool tablet because, or swimming pool department because they don't want you to mix those two up. So again, make sure you, you use the wastewater specific tablets. A lot of installers or maintenance providers will put in or give you the option to put in uh, one that uses liquid chlorine. So this is an example of a liquid chlorinator. And so it operates off of the pump in the pump tank. And so what it does is it draws in a dose of chlorine and then drops it in the pump tank. And so it uses unscented household bleach. And so with that, it's the same stuff that you have in your, your laundry room. And you just go out to a reservoir and maybe add a gallon a month or something like that. And so we can add, construct a reservoir that might hold a couple of gallons at a time. So you only have to fill it every month or every couple of months versus a tablet coordinator where we usually add a tablet per person per month. And then UV light is another option that's out there as well as ozone, but they're not quite as popular as the, the volume based systems. And um, this provides disinfection it is not sterilization. So there are some uh, pathogens that are resistant to chlorine, such as cryptosporidium and some of the other parasites. So they can survive that chlorine disinfection process and come out of those spray heads alive and well. So this by no means is this drinking water coming out of here. So this is effluent, it's treated wastewater, but it is not drinking. We still have the nutrients that are in here. And then again, some of the parasites are resistant to that chlorine disinfection. And so we're still relying on that soil to provide that final treatment for these systems. Yes, sir. Uh, what position would a rider pump go into the system? Um, usually, the only time that we so a grinder pump chops up whatever's in the wastewater. Usually, we wouldn't use a grinder pump unless we had a lift station on the opposite side of a house. If it was a, a house that had several additions or something like that, or if you put in a barn that had a restroom and we were carrying that waste of water over to the other system. Um, in that situation, we might put in a grinder pump, but usually we do not use uh, grinder pumps because they they chop up the solids to the point where it makes it really difficult for them to to sell. 
Um, so on this uh, on the diagram here, uh, in the pump tank right here, we have on this aerobic system, we have a pump in here. This is a high head pump. It looks really similar to what you would see in a water well. So it fits down into a four inch casing, if you will. Um, it's an effluent pump. It's capable of handling up to a 16th of an inch solid. And so it's it's not a solid handling pump like a, a grinding pump. So ideally, if we maintain everything, then we have minimal solids to no solids. In so, uh, again, this pump is capable of generating up to 60 PSI. So it's sitting that it's a high head pump, sitting that pressurized effluent out to the spray heads or, or out to a drip. Um, So with the, the spray heads, again, <laughs> it's not drinking water coming out of here. We're still relying on the soil to provide that final treatment. So we want, really, we want the spray heads out in a nice grass cover or grass, grassy area. Try to keep the solid objects away from the spray heads. So this photo is taken in, in Aggie land. It's a good example of what not to do. Uh, they're blasting their kids' playground equipment with this stuff every single day. It's, so what's going to happen, the water's going to hit these solid legs and it's going to create a little cesspool of bacteria at the bottom of each one of these legs. And so we want to avoid that. We really just want a grass cover around the spray heads. And during the winter time, if your grass goes dormant and you can throw out some rye or some type of cool season grass just to, again, help utilize the moisture and, and nutrients during that period. And then with the spray heads, I'll, I'll mention, um, I've got an example of one here. And so they'll have the purple top on here. And so what this does is it lets people know that it's reclaimed water coming out of here. That's what the purple is a, a standard. And so we'll use purple piping going out to the spray heads. And the reason that we do that is in case you had a plumber out one day or a landscaper, uh, there's been situations where a plumber or a landscaper tied into a line that they hit thinking that it was a water line and it was, you know, it was the effluent line. So we use purple so that way there's no mistaking it. If someone is out there digging, and then the purple top on here lets people know that it's reclaimed water, that it's not drinking water. And then also these spray heads spray at a lower angle. So they spray at 15 degrees or less. The idea there is on a windy day, we're not carrying that wastewater over onto the neighbor's property. And then also they have a little screen or a filter. And so it captures any solids. Uh, that may have made it through the pump and it prevents them from plugging up the, the spray nozzle on this, this spray head. So if you notice one spray head's not spraying like it should, um, you could unscrew the top and you know, chances are you're gonna find uh, some solids in here. Usually hair, PVC shavings and stuff like that can clog it up on, on here. And then with the pumps themselves that, that are getting the water out to here, one thing people don't realize that I'm, that's um, if you wash your produce off in the sink, if you let the little barcode tags and the PLU stickers that are on your tomatoes, apples, all that stuff, if you let those go down the drain, they're extremely resilient and they can eventually accumulate on the screen of that pump and, and starve that pump of water. So try to keep those from, from going down the drain. And then a, a complaint that I received, you probably received at your office a lot, but people will call me and say, when my neighbor's spray heads go off, it stinks, we all have to run inside. If that's going on, then that means you no longer have aerobic conditions in your system. So remember, remember I said anaerobic stinks. Aerobic systems should not have an offensive odor. So it's usually a musty smell or fresh tilled soil kind of smell that would be coming off of an aerobic system. So if the spray heads go off and it stinks, then that usually means there's too many solids in that aeration tank, or possibly there's some chemicals in there that upset the biology, or most likely it's an issue with the air pump. And so the air pump may have gone out and it needs to be rebuilt. Uh, subsurface drip tubing is another method that's out there that's pretty common. Uh, you'll especially find this on, uh, we can usually fit this in a smaller footprint. So you'll, you might find these on a smaller lot with a limited area. And so this is just a plastic tubing with a small hole um, in there roughly every two feet. And so um, it's usually plowed in about a foot below grade. 
And so just another method that's that's happening. So we'll use a pump to pressurize it. This is one that we mounted above an existing grade due to the high water table because this was in Galveston Bay. Um, and so, but it provided me with a, a good opportunity of showing what the distribution looks like. So you see the little wet spot roughly every two feet. And so that's where these little crippling others are. And I can pass it around if you're curious. I've got a separate trailer for all this visual aid stuff and then a different trailer for all the actual field inspection stuff. So try not to mix them up too often. Um, I went back to the same balcony about a year later. If you look close enough, you can see where, where that drip tubing is. So that can be arranged in a way where it does provide some supplemental irrigation. So Wimberley's one water school has seven miles of that drip tube uh, in the reuse field. And they made very sure that it was at least, uh, I think it was eight to nine inches below grade. And it looks like it's incredible. Yeah, so it, it provides a, um, a great way to, to provide irrigation to, uh, to the landscape. For sure. So you'll see it on, especially in this area, I know there's quite a few restaurants that, that utilize the drip tubing as, as well. So feeding the system, this pertains to all the different technologies. So whether you have an aerobic system or um, you know, septic system, um, whatever you have, just try to limit how much of this stuff goes down the drain. So our fats, they're solid at room temperature. So there's the potential for causing issues in the plumbing. Uh, so try to limit how much of the fats that you send down the drain. So if you're cooking brown ground beef and then you know you strain off the fats, put it in a, in the trash. Don't send that stuff down the drain. It really just accumulates in that scum layer of the tank. Our oils. So these are um, come from plants. Our vegetable oils, salad dressings, and stuff like that. They're not toxic to the system. The issue is they have trouble separating in water, so they can move through the system pretty easily. And it takes those little microorganisms that I showed about 10 times as much energy to break down the oils. So if you have leftover, you know, cooking oils or something like that, again, dispose of them. The different meanings, put them in the trash or something like that. Just don't, don't pour them down the drain. It can overwhelm those microorganisms in the system. It then grease. So the kitchen is not the sole source of grease. The bathroom is a big contributor for grease. So uh, conditioners, tanning oils, moisturizers, and all, all that are examples of, of grease. And so if there's a lot of that stuff going down the drain, it could change your, your maintenance requirements. Uh, in, in the kitchen, <laughs> so with the dishwasher, really the, the dishwashers are pretty efficient as far as their water usage, which is a great thing, but they're gonna use the same amount of water if there's one plate in there versus if it's extremely you know, full. And so I try to run it when it's full. So our main concern with the dishwasher is really the organic loading. So the food scraps that are left on the dishes, uh, scrape them off into a trash can or into a compost bin, or get one of these guys and let them run the pre-wash cycle for you. <laughs> and so the, the reason being is the food scraps that stay on the plates and the dishes, once they go down the drain, uh, they just accumulate in that tank. And it's the same thing with the garbage disposal. And so those food scraps, once they go into the tank, they accumulate in that scum layer of the tank. And the reason being is the stuff that you're sending down the, the dishwasher or down the garbage disposal hasn't gone through you first. And so since it hadn't been pre-digested by you, it's a lot harder for the microorganisms to break that stuff in. And so... Um, again, try to scrape the food scraps off into the trash or into a compost bin. If you have a garbage disposal and use it on a regular basis, you end up usually pumping the system out one to two years soon. A lot of dishwashing detergents are now advertising on television that you shouldn't have to use scrubbing. You can just put the detergent in that dishwasher right. and the food will come off, etc. Is that detrimental or positive, or is that affecting in any way? I mean, it's still. Yeah, I know. Even though it says that, I would still recommend scraping it off because it, even though this sort of probably just has a strong decreaser or something like that in there, that's still going to move all in. All that organic material, all the food scraps are still going to accumulate in that stuff. There's even garbage disposals now that advertise that it has a little injector enzymes that help break down the stuff. But again, it's still just, you're adding additional organic material that doesn't have to be there. And so it's still going to 
and then adds the non solids and accumulating in the tube. So, with laundry, really the big thing with laundry is just spacing out the usage. So, try to do laundry throughout the week or a load in the morning, a load in the afternoon. Try to space it out a little bit. Uh, if you have one day of the week that you do your entire household worth of laundry, uh, the issue that we run into is it ends up being a lot of water going through in a short period of time. And it disturbs the solid that are in the septic tank or in the aeration tank. And so, again, try to space out the laundry usage. Uh, or consider a high efficiency washing machine. I think they use 10 or 15 gallons per load, or an older one may, may use 30 or 40 gallons. So that's the savings on both your, your water well and your, your septic system. And then with the soaps, we recommend the liquid uh, laundry detergent because some of the bargain brand powder detergents have filler material in there that just adds the amount of solids that can accumulate in the tank. And then you can use bleach, just follow the directions on the bottle. And try not to, to overuse it. With the bathroom or the toilet, this toilet seat cover pretty much sums it up. Yes. Hey, is it legal to, uh, to put the weight, the, uh, your washing machine water just out on the ground? Right. Uh, so <clears throat> so the, the washing machine water is referred to as, as gray water, but there's two streams of water generally coming out of the home. So black water is the toilets and then the food, any food preparation sink. So the kitchen sink and the toilets are black water. Everything else could be considered gray water. So the showers, bathroom sinks, and the, the washing machines uh, fall into that, that gray water category. It's pretty common. There's a, they have, the rules have updated. So there's a whole different rule set in there pertaining to uh, gray water. They um, they. They originally went into effect. If you were doing it before 2005 or kind of grandfathered in before the, the newest rule set, uh, but for the most part, if you're discharging your laundry or your washing machine water, the big thing is to really have it set up to where it's on a flexible hose so you're not oversaturating the layer. So you wouldn't want it piped to the ditch or anything like that or hard pipes out to the yard. It could you know, come out with a hard pipe and then have a flexible hose on it and then usually some type of filter to capture the filament. And so there could be phosphorus in the detergent, which could, you know, the plants could utilize. And so again, it is that's usually what people will separate is the, the washing machine. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Yes. Or do you have anything to add on, on that as far as gray water? Are there additional requirements here? Mm -hmm. you know? Um I don't think it's I think, like we were saying, around 2005, I don't think it's legal for anybody to discharge the gray water on their property anymore unless they were doing it earlier. Okay. I think now it has to go into like a gray water tank and um, be equally dispersed out, kind of like the you know, drip tubing kind of irrigation. Okay. And then a lot of times when, the, when we do install a separate gray water system, they'll set it up with a valve where if you get tired of taking care of that, you can switch it over to where it starts going back into the, the septic system. So this, the toilet, it says, please not put anything into the toilet unless you've eaten it first. So try not to use it as a trash can. Really all that we want to send down the toilet, or the toilet is just toilet paper and waste. So again, don't use it as a trash can. The septic safe logo, you'll see it on cleaners, you'll see it on toilet paper and stuff like that. Just realize that it's a misleading term Really, all that it means is capable of flowing through a four inch pipe. So, my remote control is possibly septic safe, but once it gets to the tank, <laughs> nothing's going to happen. So, just realize just because it has a septic safe logo, that doesn't mean automatically being biodegradable or anything like that. Now, with toilet paper, it's a paper based product, which means it's a wood based product. So, the toilet paper will kind of break apart. But those wood base fibers are going to settle out to the sludge layer in the bottom of the tank. And that's what they're going to remain there until you have that tank pumped out. So, just like a, an old log or a stump in the bottom of a lake or a river, you know, they never really break down. Uh, just these wood based materials do not break down in this type of environment. So, again, the toilet paper, it'll kind of break apart, but then those fibers settle out into the sludge layer in the bottom of the tank. My only advice regarding the toilet paper is just try to avoid the ones that have the aloe or the moisturizer because that's an added grease that's going to accumulate in the stone layer of the tank. 
You then the wet wipes. So these are the, the baby wipes, the restroom wet wipes, uh, cleaning wipes, any of those things. Throw them into the trash. Do not flush them down the drain. I know they say flushable on them. Uh, but we've got a few that we put in a jar. Um, is, you know, we're stuck, first stuck home with COVID when my kid we did an experiment and they're still intact. So that's, you know, two, two, or, two or three years now that they've, they've been sitting in a jar and they still I pulled one out a couple months ago and it still looks the same. So these things are extremely resilient and do not break down in this environment. And so they can kind of every now and then they can catch on the baffles in the tank and cause a backup there. Um, if they get into the pump, if you have a pump on your tank, uh, they will choke up that pump and kill that pump. And so I, I run a training center where we have several different systems running in, a, in Bryan on one of the AM campuses. And I would probably burn up about $1,700 in pumps every year just because of the, the flushable wet, um, with the wet waters. And then if you have a house in the city as well, be nice to your wastewater treatment plant operator. Still throw those things in the trash. Um, cities, municipalities spend thousands of dollars every year or more battling these wet pumps. They destroy the pumps in their lift stations. They cause all kinds of settling issues in their, their treatment tanks. So even though they say flushable, uh, throw them into the trash. How do grinder pumps deal with them? Do they go through grinder pumps? So the grinder pumps will usually chew them up and eventually it, it can get to the point that even though it's still so much. And then you end up sending up, you know, material that's ground up, it's going to be hard to settle out in their own hands. Prescription drugs and antibiotics, I'm not telling you to quit taking your medicine or anything like that. Just be aware that if someone in the household's on a strong antibiotic for an extended period of time, it could potentially upset the biology and the system. So once this stuff goes through your body and enters the waste stream, it doesn't discriminate. And so it could possibly harm the, the biology and the system. Chemotherapy is, is probably the worst. In that situation, there really isn't much that we can do. Once it enters the waste stream and goes into these systems, it pretty much knocks out anything living. And so <laughs> we no longer have the settling in the septic tank. It just, everything turns into a, a slimy mess, if you will. So in that situation, Someone in the house is on chemo. Uh, if possible, try to pump the system out as often as you can during that period, whether it be every couple of weeks or possibly once a month if you can afford to, uh, just to help that system live along during that period. And then with your unused medicines, um, don't flush them down the drain. Contact usually the sheriff's department or possibly the pharmacy. We'll have a means of collecting those old prescriptions and disposing of them properly. Uh, this is probably the number one question that I get anytime I do one of these um, septic system additives. You'll see them in the hardware stores, the grocery stores, you see them advertised on TV. Uh, the third party research that was done on these things, what they found is they have not been proven to be beneficial to system performance and they're not recommended. So if they work as advertised, what they do is they go down to the bottom of the septic tank or the sludge in the bottom of the tank and can resuspend those solids into the clear zone of the tank, which means they get pushed over out to the drain field, which will shorten the life of that drain field. Or if it's an aerobic system, it means the solids can get pushed into the pump tank, which can shorten the life of that pump that's in there that can't handle solids. So there's the possibility of, of doing more harm than good. Um, 50 years I've been putting yogurt and yeast in my septic tank. Right. Does that help? You're supposed to eat it first. Which is, oh, you're supposed to eat it first? Yes, sir. <laughs> so, so none of that stuff is necessary. So yeast is a, a totally different um, strain of the bacteria and stuff like that. So it actually doesn't even really do much in the septic tank besides kind of, it's not the same type of bacteria that's naturally present in the, the septic tank. So it just kind of We'll bubble and fizz a little bit, and really that's that's about it. So I used to keep a running list of a lot of the stuff that people told me they flush. <laughs> so yeast is probably the number one thing. Uh, people were flushing buttermilk, coffee grounds, uh, hamburger meat, chicken meat. One person had a possum that ran over in front of their house. Yeah. They grabbed it and they flushed it, mm -hmm. thinking that it was feeding their system. Mm -hmm. And then to this day, so I've got a five-year-old, a seven-year-old at home. 
I regret not going to that home and giving the name of that twin because that would save me so many plunging nightmares. If they can handle a dead faucet, they can handle whatever my kids throw in there. <laughs> None of that stuff is necessary. Wastewater is a personal subject, but if you stay regular, you're putting all the beneficial stuff down the system that it would need. So homework assignment today, when you get them home, use the bathroom, and then you can check ahead with a septic system off of your to do. Yes. So when I have my, my pump, the septic company recommends an additive. Right. So what about that? There's a high markup on the additives in my yes, it is. So it's not necessary. Thank you. There's plenty of residual. They're not getting in there with a toothbrush and scrubbing all the tank walls or anything. So when you have your tank pumped out, it's it's fairly common for the, the pumper to, to push it, an additive, a septic additive to restart the system. And it's it's not necessary. There's enough stuff on the bottom of the, you know, on the tank walls and the side that it'll it'll restart on its own. Yes, sir. In that regard, do you do you have any communication with the pumpers, with the maintenance guys and say, look, guys, you're selling this upcharge stuff. Why? Right. Because I'm going to come back to a com any conference that I go to and I'm going to say, you, you don't need that stuff. Right. So the maintenance providers, so all the maintenance <laughs> providers are attending or required to go through a program. It's actually here in the same way. So it's like the basic maintenance provider training and then the advanced maintenance provider training. So they learn all this there. You should, should know that. Uh, the pumpers, one of the issues is in Texas, a lot of the pumpers, really the only requirement is a commercial driver's license. So the person that's operating the truck and pumping out the tank, um, you know, might not fully understand how these systems operate. There's a lot of good pumpers out there, but then again, there's some of them that that might just have a commercial driver's license in that sense. And so and that's to drive the truck, not the pump. Right, exactly. So there's no yeah. right now there's no pumper's license besides the truck has an endorsement from TCEQ on it that says it can handle sludge or haul sludge, and then the driver has a commercial driver's license. So um, that's one of the issues that we run into um, every now and then. It's more on the so there's a lot of installers and maintenance providers that have their own pump trucks. You know, they just bought one because they were part of you know, outsourcing that. Uh, but there's a lot of standalone pump companies that that might not be licensed installers or, or maintenance providers. They might not. they're just selling the product. They don't know if it actually does anything or not. There's extreme situations like the chemotherapy thing where I talked about wiping out everything, where there could be an additive that you add there, but the, these powders that you see on the shelves and stuff like that, there's no regulation on them. There's no USDA thing, and there's no expiration date. So it could have been sitting there five years, or you know. So there's no way to know that it's that it's active. Um, and so again, for the most part, it's it's not necessary. Yeah. Um, one of the most common questions I get is, um, you know, with water softeners. Okay. We have. Ground, we are a groundwater community right. and we have hard water, right. um, which I didn't even think about uh, from the sprayer standpoint or the, the septic system standpoint. But a lot of people go through a lot of salt. Right. Now, how does that impact uh, the functionality of the septic system if you're swapping the calcium for the sodium? Right. Through there? So, or, uh, so now in the rules, the water softeners are required now to be able to demand initiated regeneration, but the old ones just had a timer. Okay. So you could have been on vacation and it still would have regenerated just to, you know, whatever next day of the week or something like that. So at least now it looks at water flow before it regenerates. On aerobic systems, most aerobic manufacturers will, will void your warranty if you send that water straight down the drain. So they want you to bypass the, the trash tank, the aeration tank, and go directly into the pump tank with that regeneration water. Okay. Uh, with the, the septic tanks in, in drain fields, uh, with a regular septic system, you know, if you can separate it, you know, drain, but that's it's not always possible the way a house is plumbed or where that, that thing is installed. So in a septic tank, the salts can change um, Kind of the density of the water and hinder some of the settling, and then it can change the chemistry of the, the clay in the soils and can make the soils more restrictive. So, if you have a water softener, if you're able to separate that 
regeneration source, you know, that's great, or possibly consider switching to the other, the potassium based, but it's more expensive. So, yeah. Do you feel potassium is better than the sodium? Right. And we haven't done any research on it. It's been in college station, our water is already 500 parts per million from the salt. Mm -hmm. So we already have really soft. Yeah. If you come to College Station and stay in a hotel and take a shower, you'll be in there for probably 15 minutes just trying to figure out how to get the soap off your skin. <laughs> anytime someone, a family member stays at our house, you just hear them like complaining in the bathroom when they're showering. <laughs> and they finally just, you know, give up and get out. <laughs> uh, but, but yeah, if you, if you have a water softener on an aerobic system, we would ideally that that regeneration stream would bypass the treatment components and go directly into the pumps. Yes. So the regeneration stream kind of super saturated and the, just the normal right coming through is, is okay. Correct. Right. right. Yeah. So when those systems backwash, they, they just backwash out in the yard. Right. right. So some of them, depending on where the you know the water treatment guy installed it, it might backwash right into your plumbing if it's inside the utility room or you know, yeah. not on an exterior wall or something like that. So, so that's what we're talking about over ones where it's it's discharging into the existing plumbing. And then one other thing I'll talk about, just given the area, uh, does anybody, if it's your weekend home and you have an aerobic system, just realize that aerobic systems are great, but they do not thrive in a vacation home environment. And so it's an active wastewater treatment process. They like a steady supply of food. And so aerobic systems aren't necessarily ideal for a lake house, weekend home, or anything like that. Because if you're gone for a couple of weeks, those microorganisms can die off. And uh, my best advice is to, when you first come back to that property, go easy on it. Those microorganisms can repopulate in about 18 hours or so. But if you show up, you know, don't do laundry or, you know, maybe try to avoid using it. You know the big garden bathtub or something like that the first day that you're there just to give those microorganisms a chance to kind of repopulate if you wanted to on your aerobic system you could go to the aeration tank for the bubbling and the mixing is occurring and you could add a cup of sugar and a cup of cornmeal directly to the aeration tank to kind of help um, bring those microorganisms back to life quickly the sugar is just like giving candy to a kid it's going to great madness bring them back to life and then the cornmeal provides a, a little bit of, of substance. So, but again, that's all really on the aerobic system when on a vacation home environment. On our cleaning products, you can learn quite a bit just by looking at the back of the bottle for the cleaning products. And so it should have one of these three labels on there. Usually it'll say danger, warning, caution. And so you can try to estimate potential impacts on the system by these labels. If it says danger, it means it will kill the bacteria in the system. So try to minimize or eliminate the use of that product if you can. With warning, it's kind of middle of the road. So if that's your favorite cleaning product, maybe try to space out usage. Try not to overuse it. Overuse it, and then caution is usually your, your best thing. So if it has the caution label, usually it'll have minimal impact or no impact on your body to the septic system. Uh, with drain cleaners, we definitely recommend the mechanical route for removing the clogs. Uh, you can buy a plumbing snake for a few dollars from a hardware store that will clean the pee traps in the, you know, the bathroom sinks, the showers and tubs and stuff like that. Uh, this couple tablespoons of this drain cleaner will knock out your system for a few days. So it's, it's that toxic. So again, try to go the mechanical route if you have a, a clogged drain. So I'll quickly go through some of the operation and maintenance on the septic system, you know, we're kind of you know, short on time. But this, a lot of this pertains more to uh, the aerobic system, I mean, to the, the regular septic tanks and drain fields. We have an entire six hour class dedicated to the aerobic system, just due to the, the number of pieces and components. But if any of this stuff looks like fun to you and you're eager to try it when you get home, just try to avoid doing this. Uh, it's a confined space, these gases are potential byproducts of the different treatment processes. Hydrogen sulfide could be present and it's at a high enough concentration that if you're breathing the stuff in, if you're leaning over the hole like this and you breathe it in, you know, it, it could knock you out. And if you're leaning over like that, you could be, you know, going in. So again, don't stick your head down in there. I've had homeowners throw a ladder in the septic tank while I was there trying to get a baby wipe out. 
Again, don't do that. Carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, we have no idea of the concentration. There's no odor. And then methane is just one of the explosive gases that can be in the soil. Again, don't breathe this stuff in, don't enter the tank. And then other hazards, uh, kids and pets are naturally curious. If you open up your system and then you realize that you forgot a tool in the shop, uh, put that lid back on, never walk away from an open hole. On aerobic systems, this is a, an aerator, pretty much the same one that's right below it. Uh, but we'll usually have a little housing that sits over here to keep the, the weather off of it. The fire ants love these things um, and the wasp as well. And then during the winter time, you know, that aerator generates a little bit of heat. So it's not uncommon to find a snake in that housing. So just be aware of if you're removing the cover on there, you know, if you're doing an inspection, just be aware you never know what you're going to find underneath that, that house. And then accessibility. So if your system's not easily accessible, if it's buried, uh, you can contact an installer and have them add these, these risers. So this is an example of an access riser. There's there's several different companies that are manufacturers. Uh, these are sold. Uh, they'll have an adapter flange that would adapt to a, an existing lid. And they're sold in different diameters and different heights. This is the six inch riser uh, by 20 inch uh, diameter. Uh, but again, there's several different sizes and we could actually stack as many of these as we need to bring a, a lid up to the surface. And then, Inside of the riser, we'll, we'll have some type of secondary lid in case that top lid were to fail. Uh, the industry term that we use for these is the, the kitten catcher. And so it's here to serve as a added safety in case that top lid were to fail. Another example of that is this net that you see here. It's a plastic net. And so again, that's there in case this, this top lid were to fail. So again, there's several different options when it comes to these um, that are available. It just it makes it a lot easier to, to maintain the system. So the lid will be screwed down and secured, uh, but we don't have to dig when it comes down to, to pumping out or inspecting the system. Do what you can to divert rainwater away from the tank. So when it when it does rain, we don't want that water sitting on top of the tanks or on top of the drain fields. Uh, because it, it will find its way into the tanks eventually. If you have an aerobic system and the spray heads go off every time it rains, and that's usually a good indication that that, that rainwater is, is trying to find its way into the tank or has kind of found its way in, into the tank. And so try to divert the rainwater away from the components. These systems do vent back through the plumbing, uh, through the vent stack on the roof. So occasionally if the wind's blowing just right, you might get that rotten egg odor. Uh, but we shouldn't have any odors around the tanks or around the, the drain field or, or the spray heads. The water, if you open up the tank, the inlet side is usually three inches higher. So what we look at is the outlet sides of the water going out to the drain field. It should be right here at the bottom of the invert of that outlet pipe. If you open it up and it's well below that, and that could be a crack in the tank or an issue there. Or if it's well above that, then that usually points to an issue downstream. Um, a lot of the times it could be uh, a possible break in the pipe going out to the drain field that have allowed roots to come in there and block up that pipe or plug up that pipe, excuse me. So pumping is a necessary part of maintenance to remove the solids before they accumulate to the points where they go to the next component downstream. And so again, this is done by um, the pumper, the truck is registered, the haul sludge, so it has that TCQ registration number on there. So that means they're going to dispose of it properly. They're not going to pull the plug when they get on the county road or anything like that. They're going to usually go to the nearest wastewater treatment plant and offload it. So when do you pump out a septic tank? It's when the solids account for roughly a quarter to a third of the total tank capacity. Um, and so what we do is we'll measure the depth of the scum and the depth of the sludge. And so we can you know, estimate the percentage that way. Or if the floating scum layer extends down and gets within uh, three inches of the bottom of this outlet pipe, we want to go ahead and pump the tank. Or if the sludge layer on the bottom gets so deep that it gets within 12 inches of the bottom of the pipe here, then we would want to pump out that tank. So this is usually every three to five years, but it really varies based on the size of the system and, and your water use habits. 
with aerobic systems, your maintenance provider does the regular checks and they check the solids when they come out there. And so they should give you a, an idea of when you would need to pump out that system. And so with aerobic systems, it's usually in that same window, usually every three to five years, you'd want to pump out those systems as well. You want to pump out these tanks when it's nice and dry out, when there's no rain in the forecast, because when these tanks are empty, they're pulling. So if the surrounding soil is, is saturated and you pump out the tank, uh, and you risk that tank floating up out of the ground or possibly collapsing under the weight of the soil. So how do we measure that? Uh, we've got these, this tool that we use in the field. Uh, it's known as either a dipstick or a sludge judge is one of the um, common terms. It's actually one of the, the brands. Uh, what this is, is just a clear tube with some type of ball valve at the bottom. So this one has an automatic ball valve. And so what I do is I go to the outlet side of the tank. I'll drop this down into the tank. And then when I lift it up, the ball valve closes. And then I can see the profile of the, the septic tank. And this one here, you can see the sludge. And then you can see a clear zone and, and then the scum layer. Uh, can anyone see the three layers here? So the homeowner went 17 years without pumping. Mm -hmm. He was really proud of that fact until I almost had to stand on this thing to get it to go through Whoa. all those solids. So it was definitely well overdue. And so you can buy these tools. Um, I mean, even, even Amazon has them, but you can buy them usually online for around 90 bucks to maybe $150. Or contact your maintenance provider or your, or your pumper. They all have these. They could come out there and measure the solids and let you know when it's time to pump out the tank. Mm -hmm. We've got this chart. It's kind of a rough estimation on how often you would pump out a tank. And so this is just for a, a septic tank. And so what it looks for is the size of the tank and the column on your left. And then across the top, it has a number of people in the household. So if we had a thousand gallon system, and then say if we had three people in the house, we find that that intersects and it says 3.7, roughly every four years, you'd want to pump out that system. And so, um, and I can send out the publication that has this um, through email, but it's again, just an estimation. The best way to know is, is really just to have the solid picture. And then baffles. So these are critical to the operation of the tank. So the inlet baffle, what this does is it slows the energy of that incoming water so it's not disturbing that sludge layer. The tank, depending on the size or the age of the tank, it may have this wall or baffle in here. Another way to achieve that is just to have multiple tanks in the series. So you might have a two 500 gallon tanks in a row. It achieves that same effect as that one large tank with that wall or baffle. Uh, but probably the most critical on a septic tank is the outlet baffle. And so this blocks that floating scum layer from going out to the drain field. Anytime I open up a tank and there's no scum on the top, I know right away that this thing is, is missing. And so every now and then I'll find one of these laying in the bottom of the tank. Usually the, the cause of that is an old lid that had cracked and broke and fell through and sheared this off and the homeowner replaced the lid but didn't realize that, um, you know, that it had broken the stock. Yeah, there's other configurations for the baffles. Um, it could be a plastic or fiberglass baffle against the tank wall. The most common method is a PVC T, so the sanitary T that you see here is usually what we'll use for a baffle in a separate tank. And then an effluent screen, if you're wondering what's hanging out of this pipe here, that's what this is. And so this is an effluent screen. So you could find this on a regular septic tank. They're not required in, in Texas. Uh, but it's just added insurance for your drain field so it captures any solids that might be trying to leave a tank and prevents them from going out to the drain field. They are maintenance items. If you have one, it's something that would be pulled out every couple of years or rinsed off and dropped back in. The most common place I find these is behind the barn or behind the garage because in two years they plug up, the homeowner gets frustrated, they rip it out, throw it back there and forget about it. But it's, it's capturing solids that would otherwise accumulate or out in that, that thing here. And then the last thing that I have uh, is the, the actual structural conditions of the tanks. When we do inspections or maintenance, we'll glance in there and make sure that we don't see any roots coming in. If the roots are coming in, it means that 
there's water tightness issues. So uh, usually they, the roots can come in around the lids or around the inlet and outlet pipes. If the roots get in, it means the rainwater could possibly leak in as well, or wastewater could possibly leak out. Then also I checked the lid. So this lid was from the 80s. The hydrogen sulfide that's present can produce sulfuric acid, which falls away the concrete and can eventually expose that rebar. And so just some of the other things that we check for. To do this, I use a mirror on a stick at roughly a 45 degree angle and shine a flashlight right here that allows me to see the underside of the lid, or I'll just use a digital camera, snap a few photos and look. I've had people ask why I don't use a, a selfie stick. Um, that would work great, but you know, if your cell phone, your wastewater, you know, you you go ahead and, and do that. <laughs> really, that's that's all that I have. Um, no, I'm just, you know, I'm over on on time. But, um, if anybody has any questions or you think of anything later on, uh, the contact information is right here. Yeah, Aaron, Aaron's gonna say a few words. And then we can have some um, time for questions at the end when we're finished up. I've got a course evaluation. I'll pass around and meet up in. So you get to grade me. There's no exam today. Uh, but if, you, if you've got a moment, any feedback you can provide on here. Well, I'll kind of talk while we work. As they mentioned, my name is Aaron McCoy. I'm an Ag and Natural Resources Agent for Hayes County. Um, I'm one of the ones who's in charge of putting on some public education programs, um, putting out public knowledge for our members of Hayes County uh, for the topics such as agriculture, livestock production, horticulture, and natural resources. Um, coming into Hayes County, I didn't know what an emphasis natural resources would be on my job, but I am thankful that it has been exposed to me. Um, just as you are, gaining knowledge is our biggest opponent against this biggest threat that we have. Um, so please continue to share this knowledge. If you ever have any questions, please reach out to my office. We'll be help, uh, helpful in facilitating an answer. Um, please look at our website. We always have events coming up on stuff such as oak will, wildlife, stuff along those lines. Um, so if you'd like to keep in contact with our office, just reach out and we'd be happy to help you out. Thank you. Okay. Okay, I'm gonna just talk for a brief few minutes to um, add on what David had said about the Cypress Creek Watershed Protection Plan. And um, to give you a little background, I'm with the Meadows Center. My name is Jenna Walker. And I have taken over as the, the watershed protection coordinator. Um, we are the keeper of the watershed protection plan. Um, it is funding that comes from EPA through the Texas Commission for Environmental Quality to the Meadows Center to, um, to manage this watershed protection plan. It has been in place for over 10 years now and is, is winding up. And um, one of the things that I've always learned and, and been reminded of for watershed protection plans is that they're designed as seed money to support a community that's looking to protect their water resources, um, to give them a boost to get a project off the ground. And then really the, the um, idea is that sustainable um, programming can be built at that time to carry this project on. And then that funding um, ends and goes towards other projects around the state to, to do the same thing. And so we, we are experiencing that with Cypress Creek now. Um, we're in the final um, six months of funding, of federal funding, and the Watershed Association has, has taken the lead to um, help guide this project in the future. 
So um, just want to give you all a heads up on that, that probably we'll be hearing more from us and the Watershed, Watershed Association in the future about, <clears throat> excuse me, how we can um, keep this project alive and um, with support from the community with the goal in mind of keeping Cypress Creek flowing, keeping it clear and clean. Clean, clear, and flowing. So I'm not going to go too deep into it, but I really just want to emphasize the partnerships that um, are that have made this program possible in addition to the federal funding. It, it requires 40% match by by partners. And, and really that's how it, it's gonna stay alive. Here's our website and that will remain will remain live and continue to provide resources to um, stakeholders. You can visit that for a lot more information. And here is a map of our quarterly water quality monitoring. And the idea is that we'll continue with that um, beyond the the official uh, TCEQ funding, which ends in September. So these are the sites where the Meadow Center is um, monitoring on a quarterly and sometimes monthly basis. And um, really appreciate y'all as partners to help us protect this very incredible and valuable resource. So happy to answer any questions or um, Please follow up with me later. And thank you so much for attending. And David's going to say a few words to folks. Yeah, thanks, Jim. Yes. And, uh, and let's give Brian a hand for that great presentation. I'm sure we'll sort of get that. That's such a presentation. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, just follow on, Jenna. Uh, kind of like the plan for the summer, we're, we're going to, uh, you know, we've been meeting with the, the main. Stakeholders, um, I think, are, are you two guys, but, <laughs> but, but uh, the cities, Wood Creek, Kimberly, Case County, Aqua, Case uh, Trinity, and landowners, citizens, businesses, everyone's welcome. We're going to be having meetings over the summer, set kind of reaffirming some goals. The main, the main part of the watershed protection plan is setting goals for the water quality parameters. That we want to meet that clean part and the the, the flowing part. We want to we want to, we want to, we need to do better on uh, our groundwater. And there'll be a meeting this Thursday, groundwater industry meeting that will pass out some. Uh, the, the, at the beginning of that meeting, there'll be a presentation by Marcus Carey about the groundwater management zone, which is our main tool for the groundwater protection. And there will also be a notice of violations. Aqua overpumped their permit by 175 acre feet last year. So even during that critical drought, they were severely not curtailing the way they should have. That and so they're going to be fine for that. We're going to have to hear how they're going to address that issue. But that's the, really the biggest threat to Cypress Creek is that pumping and that upper water chain. So we're working with them now to try to move some wells out of the out of the that are in that critical zone. They drilled two new wells. We're about to like the site and two other wells further down dip. We think moving that pumping out of the zone is one potential way to keep that the spring flowing during uh, these critical drought times. But we are about 18 inches behind our normal rainfall from last year. But uh, we'll be setting those goals. We'll be working with this, the stakeholders uh, probably through ultimately an interlocal agreement that we contribute some monies towards um, Robin's time. The watershed's going to put in match to you know to, to work on that, and then the water quality monitoring, and then whatever other projects. I think you know looking at these stormwater issues that you found me on the Cypress Creek Nature Trail. Uh, uh, overall kind of bring the plan for the whole area. I think there's a number of things we can do, but we want to keep the plan going. The watersheds, when we kind of step up into that coordinator role, we'll keep our partnership going with, with Meadows to do the science and the monitoring. 
um, in other special studies. The Meadows has also worked on us to do, you know, special special groundwater studies, looking at things like e the E. coli issue there at the square, which is kind of an ongoing, um, you know, question is, is it the bats? Is it the septics? What's causing this, this increase? And I would say the summary of our, of our data Kind of shows we are increasing nutrients, you know, over the last, you know, 15, 18 years since we've been monitoring. And as the flows diminish, there's all the oxygen drops and then the fish, you know, can't survive uh, and aquatic life. So we really need to kind of figure out how we can do more on those two issues. And uh, um, I think this presentation today gives some good info in terms of the Kind of the point source that comes from our from our septics, but we can do better manage that. So, um, so stay, you know, just stay tuned. Uh, if you if you're not signed up to the Watershed Association website, um, sign up for the newsletter and keep you posted there. And uh, and I've got a couple more. I've got four more T-shirts mm -hmm. here. So, um, so then the question: More yeah. light pays terms of my water. Yeah, the newspaper said. 5 p.m. Okay. I'm young to that. Yeah. Robin's email said 6 p.m. I think it's 5. Yeah. 5 where, where is it going to be? It's at, at, at the Camp Young Judea uh, conference room. At their little conference room there. And it's uh, it's high. Yeah. And we, I think we want, you know, this is a, it's a delicate thing because we've been trying to work with Aqua. You know, and get them to do. We we have an MOU that we've been working on with the, with the city leaders and the county, but to turn you know to turn around and do you know basically yeah. not do anything on the drought was just it was quite a blow because they were like oh we're you know we're telling everybody to conserve but it didn't happen they overpumped like I said 175 acre feet that's 50. 55 million gallons. That's nearly mm -hmm. a quarter of the flow of Jacob's Well every other year. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, from <laughs> yeah. So, so that's that's a long that that is a very dated view. Though that's been our challenge for 20, 25 years. It's ticking it's, time bomb. It's a ticking time bomb. <laughs> and and with, with I like to blow. You know, and, and it looks like we're going to have a dry summer too. And you know, we may not see the El Nino or La Nino until um, until maybe fall or maybe in the first of the year. So it's going to be another rough summer. But uh, appreciate you all coming out. Sorry, you know we've run over. Um, you know, I think I'm just going to. I think I'm just going to do this. <laughs> I'm going to do this, <laughs> and then there, and then there you go. Man. And uh, yeah, grab grab the brochure or uh, and we've got some list cool Jacob Well stickers back there. If, if it's too small, I guess you have to give it to one of your your your, uh, your grandkids. <laughs> and you wouldn't look at me and say that it's too small. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, maybe look in the mirror. I don't know. <laughs> Thank you guys for coming Thanks. out. Appreciate y'all. You, if you have any other questions before we close, any comments. I think it was great. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. To find out why my company doesn't use that stuff. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.